before moving back to Brazil in 2002, uh, I had spent the previous six years teaching at a high school in Texas. And I've shared with you many, of t many times my love for coaching. This is the ironic side of things. When I coached in the United States, I coached soccer. Um, when I moved to Brazil, I coached basketball. So I coached this team for six years. Our departure date for Brazil was September 10th. So, um, or actually September 9th. And so I was actually still in the U.S. for the beginning of that next year, the beginning of the new school year and the new soccer season. They had brought a new coach in, a guy who was a little bit younger than I, and he was new to the school, new to the school's customs and traditions and way of doing things. And so the director of the school, even though I was no longer employed by the school, asked me if I would continue to function sort of as an assistant coach for the first three weeks of the of the uh, season. In retrospect, that was not a good idea. But um, I was uh, young enough and immature enough at the time that I was super excited to be able to, to take that role. Uh, but it was a challenge for me. It, but it was a bigger challenge for the new coach. And it was a greater challenge for the players. Uh, because they, they had, over the course of six years, they had learned to look, at, look to me, to instinctively listen to me and to trust me. And I loved them. And it was very hard for me to be silent, to allow the new coach to take his place and to not interfere. But as I said earlier, it was especially hard for the new coach. Since I was still around, it was hard for him to institute changes. It was hard for him to gain the trust of the players. The best thing for that transition was for me to leave and simply not be around anymore. And after a couple weeks, that's exactly what happened. Along with Julie and Ethan, I moved to Brazil. This morning, I want to talk to you about transitions. In particular, the major change that occurs in the first 11 verses of the book of Acts. And I'm, I'm calling this passage the Great Transition. We hear a lot about the Great Commission from Matthew 28. This is the Great Transition. God is preparing and transitioning the disciples from the physical presence of Jesus to the unseen presence of the Holy Spirit. And to be clear, they are equally God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, equally God. We're not talking about a different God, but we're talking about a different way that believers, a different way that the disciples of God are going to experience His presence. And this is important for us, the church today, because we too live with the presence the unseen presence of the Holy Spirit, because Christ is no longer physically present to us. In this passage, God has packed in seven specific ways that he is bringing the disciples to transition. And we'll see that there are some pretty radical changes that are going to come about because of this. So this morning, I want us to examine those seven calls to transition. I'll read first this passage in Acts chapter 1 will overlap a little bit with what I read last week. Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, and I'll be reading through verse 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly 
two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The first transition is to the communication of the Holy Spirit. For just a moment, I want to go back to that coaching transition that I began with and tell an earlier part of the story. My first year coaching soccer there, I too took over from the only coach that that school had ever known before. He was older than I. He was bigger than I in every way. He was a huge personality. He was a former American football lineman at Texas Tech University, and he had been a football coach in another high school previously. So he was a true Texan, and this man had a very loud voice. And he had something that I did not have, and that was a Texas accent. And the ears of Texans are attuned to the Texas accent. I remember the first few games that I coached. Oh, let me just add this. His son was the best player on the team. I remember the first few games that I coached when he was watching on the sideline. And he wasn't doing anything that he shouldn't have been doing, but his voice was so loud and the boys were so used, their ears were attuned to his voice, to listening to him, that I had a very hard time competing to be heard. It took a few weeks for the players to learn to listen to my voice instead of to his. The first transitional move that we see in verse 2 is a move of communication. The disciples are used to hearing Jesus speak to them directly. He is physically present with them. He's teaching. He's instructing. He's dialoguing. But then here, Luke makes an interesting statement that after his resurrection, Jesus is communicating with his disciples near the end of his earthly ministry, and he's giving them instructions through the Holy Spirit which is an interesting statement since Jesus is still physically present with them. Now, we don't know exactly what format that took. We we don't know the mechanism, but that's not important. that's, That's the how is not important. What's important is that it happened. The Holy Spirit is now becoming the mediator of Christ's communication. And Luke is establishing that fact. After all, the Holy Spirit is one of his primary themes in this book. I can't take too much time on this today, but notice what the Holy Spirit is communicating. This is very important. It's the words of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is communicating. So it's the word of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit does not communicate anything apart from the unity of the Trinity. The Father and the Son speak with, together, and through the Spirit. And for us, this is particularly important because we have the written word of God. And so we must understand and remember that the the Holy Spirit speaks through this word. He is the one that impresses this word onto our hearts and minds. He is the one who interprets the word. He is the one who convinces people of the truth of the word. He is the one that helps us apply the word correctly. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of reading a well-known passage in the Bible, one you've read many times before. Maybe it's your practice in your Bible to mark and make notes and underline things, and you're reading a passage that you already know. You've read it many times. You know what's coming. You know what's ahead. But for some reason, that day, at that moment, there is a new light that is shed on that passage and you have a different experience of it. Maybe a better way to say that is you apply it, you understand how it applies more directly to you and your situation right there. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Word of God is not dead, but it is dynamic and living and active. It says that about itself. It is living and active because the Holy Spirit is ministering it. The Holy Spirit is speaking through it to the church, to the people of God. The Holy Spirit always communicates in accordance with the words of Jesus, meaning with the words of God, in accordance with Scripture, never against it, because he always communicates in agreement with the Father and the Son. 
And so Jesus is preparing the disciples for to hear the communication of God in a different way than they've heard it up to that point. That brings us to the second transition. The second transition is to the timing of the Holy Spirit. Luke starts with the communication of the Spirit because everything else will flow out of the disciples' commitment to, discernment of, and surrender to what the Spirit says. This flows logically into the timing of the Spirit. Jesus tells the disciples in verse 4 that they should not take the timing of things into their own hands, but should wait for the Spirit. Go back to Jerusalem and wait. Doing anything apart from the timing of the Holy Spirit will result in difficulty and potentially failure. And this goes back to the importance of listening to the Word of God. To this, as the Spirit communicates to us through the Word of God, guiding us in His timing. Now there are two ways we can fail to follow the timing of the Spirit. The first way is rushing ahead on our own. I can picture Peter doing this, the disciple Peter. I can imagine, because we're told in Scripture, there are many times where Peter acts impulsively and reactively without considering even the timing or the appropriateness of his actions. Now, the other way is to be too slow, taking too long to move, to being stagnant as the Holy Spirit is calling us to move. I can see myself more in this category. Maybe along with Thomas, hanging back a little bit, saying, well, I'm not convinced yet. The point Jesus makes in this transition, however, is that the disciples should learn to do everything according to the Spirit's timing. Sometimes that would mean to wait. Sometimes that will mean to go. In this context, then, his call to them was to wait. Now, this brings us to the third call to transition. This is an odd call. But it has to do with the way that the disciples, and by extension, we, the church, should understand the Holy Spirit that he comes as a gift. That's, a, that's what Jesus calls him, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And which gift? A gift that the Father has promised. So we do have to ask the question, according to Scripture, does the Father give bad gifts? Absolutely not. I bring this up, of course, because it's in the text, but also because I think we believe that the presence of the Holy Spirit is somehow less than the presence of Jesus in the flesh. Let's be honest with ourselves for a moment. Have you ever thought, because I know I have, that the Christian life would be so much easier if Jesus were standing and walking physically beside me every day? If I were talking with him every day? If I were interacting with him physically, okay, physically um, and verbally every day? And that somehow that is a better gift than the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's not what Scripture teaches. And if you question that, consider how many times the disciples screwed up when they were living with Jesus every day. Imagine how many times they showed a lack of faith, a lack of understanding, how many times they showed pride, how many times they wanted to be first in the kingdom of heaven. They wanted honor for themselves how often they missed what Jesus was trying to do and missed what he was teaching. So we, we live under this false impression that, oh man, things would be so much easier if Jesus were physically present, if God were physically present with me. That's not what we're shown in Scripture. The Father has given the Spirit to us as individuals, to the church as a gift, a good and great gift. The Godhead limited Jesus on earth to the presence of his physical body. Okay, so when Jesus was on earth, his, Jesus, the presence of Jesus was limited to that physical body. The Holy Spirit is not only omnipresent, but according to Scripture, he lives in and through the children of God. Is that not an amazing gift? What a difference. He is able to be everywhere. I'm not saying, please hear me. Now, I'm, not, I'm also not arguing that the Holy Spirit is greater than Jesus because he's not. How can God be greater than God? But then in God's plan, the Spirit would birth the church with a presence beyond the physical. 
God would be present in and with his people everywhere, all the time, in a new way. The Holy Spirit is not a consolation prize. He's the great gift of God himself from the Father to the church. And although I, I, I want you to understand, I'm not com comparing myself to Jesus, nor the coach who replaced me at that school as the Holy Spirit. But I do remember that um, a few weeks after we had gotten to Brazil, I actually received a phone call, long distance. Remember those long distance phone calls before there were VoIP, um, before we had voice over internet, before Skype, before those things. I actually received a long distance call from some of the players on that had been on my team that I coached. And they said, coach, guess what? We just beat Audi International today. And in my heart, I was like, oh man, they were our greatest rivals. We had never beaten them. I never coached a game in which we beat them. Now out loud, I said, wow, that's great. Yeah, way to go. But, but what's happening is this, this new coach was able to take them the next step. Um, and uh, so the Holy Spirit is given as a gift from the Father to move the church into its next season to multiply its work. Now we move on to the fourth transitional call. And this is a transition to the plans of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus tells the disciples that the Holy Spirit is coming, he's also requiring of them submission to the plans of the Spirit. Just as the disciples would walk in obedience to Jesus, so they must walk in obedience to the Spirit. In verse 6, the disciples ask Jesus, Are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So it's like the disciples have just said, Wow, God's giving us this gift of the Spirit. We're gonna we, so we can use that gift to do our plans. We can use that gift to perform what we've always wanted to see happen. And it shows us that disciples still don't have a full understanding of Jesus' purpose on earth. They have witnessed his death and resurrection, but they still don't fully grasp that his goals are not political and they're not primarily earthly. Now that he's risen and conquered death, they're convinced now that he's done this, now that he's shown his power, he's going to invest it all through the Holy Spirit, to set Israel as a nation free from Roman rule, to reestablish the Davidic kingship, to make Israel a world power again in its own right. So maybe they hear, as I said, that the Spirit comes as a gift, and so they can use that gift for their purposes and their plans. And we often do that with God, don't we? Rather than ask God, what is your plan? We say, God, bless my plan. And interestingly enough, though, Jesus does not directly rebuke them, nor does he deny that Israel might be restored, but he does tell them basically it's not their business. <laughs> That's kind of a hard thing to hear, isn't it, from Jesus? That's not your business. He said, it's not for you to know. It's not for you to know the days or the hours. It's not for you to know the times or the plans that the Father himself has chosen. That's not for you to know. You don't worry about that because that's not the plan. It's not your place, says Jesus, to be in control. It is the place of the Spirit. It is not for you to know the times or dates or hours. To us today, we're called to that same submission to the plans of the Spirit, to the plans of God. Is our timeline, our future, our plan fully surrendered to the Lord? Now, in a moment, we're going to see what the plans of the Spirit are. So that leaves us hanging there just for a moment. But at this point, what... What Jesus is saying to his disciples, hold on, You're, you need to learn to surrender to the plans and the work of the Spirit. He is the one that's going to be performing it. You're not leading this, disciples. You guys aren't leading a revolution to restore Israel. You are going to be working through what the Holy Spirit intends to happen. Then we come to the fifth transition in verse 8. And this is the power of the Spirit. For those of you who grew up in Christian homes and you had, or maybe Christian schools or both, and you had to memorize verses, I guarantee you at some point in your life, you've memorized Acts 1.8. In, in this verse, Jesus turns smoothly and clearly from this political misunderstanding of the disciples to a focus upon the gift of the Spirit and the Spirit's work in the world. But the first point he notes is the power of the Spirit. You will receive power 
When? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. Not before. And they already told him it wasn't going to be right then because they still had to go back to Jerusalem and wait. But they would receive it when the Holy Spirit came. He is the source of the power of God in the church to carry out the work of God in and through the church. So when the church or individuals within the church try to carry out God's work apart from the power of the Spirit, it will not last. There is a, a place at home where I have my daily morning quiet time, and I have it set up just the way I like it. It's a, a, a sofa, and I sit on one end of the sofa, and maybe this is more information than you want. I put my, my feet up on a chair in front of me. I have my coffee cup to my left. I have my Bible and my journal with me, and right up here, I have a lamp. And um, I turn on that lamp, and that illuminates what I need to see. Uh, it's usually dark outside still. I love that time. I love that place. You know what really chaps my hide? You know what really irritates me? Is when one of my sons, I won't name which one is the usual culprit, at some point the evening before unplugs the lamp to plug in the iPad. So I get myself all situated there. I've got my pen, I've got my journal, I've got the word of God. I have my coffee, I have the chair pulled up and I reach up to switch on the light and it doesn't turn on. It just gets my quiet time off to a terrible start. <laughs> I may be exaggerating a little bit, but it does annoy me. So then I have to undo my whole setup. I have to go over there. I've got to plug it back in. Now, the point I want to make with that is the frustration that arises in me with, with the lamp. It's not the lamp's fault, right? I mean, it's not the fault of the lamp that it can't function as it should. Why? Because it doesn't have the power. It's not um, connected to the power source. The power of God is given on earth through the Spirit. And that's the point Jesus is trying to get across to his disciples. If you try to do something, even something for me, if you try to do something that, that even on the surface looks good, but it's not empowered by the Spirit, because the Spirit's not leading that way, then you're going to be frustrated. Don't try to carry out your own plans, assuming you'll use the power of the Spirit. Because when the Spirit's leading, he will give the power for you to carry out the plans of God. Don't try in your own power. And there are examples that we see of this in Scripture. You know, uh, the one that comes most readily to mind is when King David wanted to build a temple for the Lord. I mean, that was a good desire, wasn't it? Wasn't that a right desire to honor God above himself, to build a, a palace, a temple for God? And God says, no, that's not my will for you. That's a good thing, but you're not the one to do it. Sixthly, the sixth call to transition to the Spirit. And this is the work of the Spirit. And now we see what the plans of the Spirit are. What is the work that the Spirit will perform on earth that he longs to do through the people of God, through the, through the church? Again, here it is in verse 8. Jesus tells them that the Spirit will give them power, but it's for a specific and primary purpose, isn't it? He doesn't give his church power. He doesn't give individuals of his church power so that they can do whatever they want. He doesn't give them power so that they can go out and exercise all these different things on their own. There is a guiding principal purpose of the power of the Spirit in the church. And that is to inspire the church to be witnesses of the truth of Jesus Christ. Now that can be very broad. That can take place in a variety of different ways. But when Jesus describes the power of the Spirit to the disciples, it is the power for witness. And as you read Acts, as we move through it together, I'm going to point this out. If you read through Acts on your own, just underline every time the word witness or witnesses is used. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. 
And so the work of the Spirit is to give power to the church to be faithful, true, bold witnesses of Jesus Christ. So to go back to my lamp for a moment, just as the lamp by my little sofa study receives the power of electricity for the specific purpose of illuminating the environment around it, so the disciples will receive the power of the Spirit specifically to be witnesses of and for Jesus. So if I decide on my own, wow, this lamp has power. It's lighting up. It's got power. So I'm going to use it to play baseball because it has power. Well, it's not going to function very well as a baseball bat, number one. Number two, it's going to be destroyed. Now, I can't blame the lamp for its lack of power to play baseball. And this is what I'm saying. When we talk about the spirit and the power that the spirit brings, that's not a power that we're given to exercise as we want to exercise it or for the purposes for which we think would be best. I'm not saying that the Spirit only gives power to witness, but that is his focus. That is his work on earth and through the church, isn't it? This is a, a reflection again of the great commission in Matthew, Matthew 22. I'm sorry, Matthew 28. So here we have in Matthew 28, the, the gospel writer Matthew records the words of Jesus saying what? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Now here, do you hear that same echo in Acts 1.8? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. From that power, you will be my witnesses and there are many um, and not just many, but most scholars, I think it's pretty clear, they see this verse as kind of an outline of the book of Acts. And we're going to see that. It starts in Jerusalem. And then that witness is going to spread beyond to where? Judea and Samaria. And then where is it going to go? Just like Acts 1 says, to the ends of the earth. It's going to end up in Rome. And from there, the rest is history, as we say. And what is that spread? It's the witness. It's the witness of the truth of Jesus. It's the witness of the gospel, empowered in and through the church by the Holy Spirit. If you are seeking to understand the primary purpose that God has for you as an individual, and the primary purpose of the church corporately, this is it. It's to be witnesses of Jesus. That is it. This is what our vision statement tries to capture in saying that Calvary International Church is a vibrant family glorifying God through what? Multiplying, discipling, equipping, and sending. Each of those four nouns touches on this idea of being a witness. What does a witness do? Have you considered that before? What does a witness do? A witness sees, hears, understands, and experiences something and then shares that with others who do not yet understand. They testify. These men and women that Jesus is talking to at the beginning of Acts, they had seen, lived, and experienced the transformative physical presence of Jesus. And they were going through the presence and empowerment of the Spirit to be the ones to take the reality of the resurrection to the world. It's interesting that there, there are some churches and some groups who really get into this question of apostolic succession. You know that there are this, this, these apostles have descended from the original apostles, but we don't see that in Acts. What we see is a passing on of the witness and the message, not a passing on of the position. It's, it's, very, it's, it's interesting um, because what's going forth is the witness to Christ, and that is the emphasis and remember, this is our history. I talked about this last week. We're not, we are following in the same vein. We have been given, the church has been given the power of the Spirit to be witnesses on earth for Jesus in the world. Everywhere. If you're seeking what God's primary calling on you is, this is it. Of course, we all have secondary callings. God calls us to live out this calling in different ways. But this is the primary one to be witnesses of Jesus in the world for his glory by the power of the Spirit. Okay, we've come to number seven, the seventh call to transition. 
And this is the presence of the Holy Spirit. How the church is going to experience the presence of God will be different. It may seem to you that these, this, this verse 11 kind of ends on a downer. Um, Jesus ascends into heaven. A cloud receives him out of their sight. Now, just let me comment on that cloud briefly. That's an image of the Shekinah glory of God. So I think we need to understand that that cloud, it's not like a little rain cloud that we imagine here, okay? Most likely it was a bright, shining cloud that, that, that engulfs Jesus. It's the kind of cloud that descended over Mount Sinai. It's the cloud that covered and entered the tabernacle as the glory of God dwelt there. It's a cloud that descended on Jesus and some of his disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. So this is God clearly showing the disciples the glorification of Christ. And you know, if you read the scripture carefully, you'll see that Jesus, after his resurrection, he was not with the disciples all the time. In fact, we see here at Luke, it said he appeared often to them. At the beginning of Acts, rather, he appeared, he appeared, he appeared. The point is that Jesus, after his resurrection, he was already glorified. It says that he ate with them from time to time. And if you take that in context, it, that's like a proof of life. Jesus is saying, look, I really am alive. I'm not a ghost. Give me something, I'll eat it. But he didn't need to eat to sustain because his body had been glorified. He appears, he comes and goes, and this is part of that transition. So now he goes up and the glory of God receives him. And the disciples are like, understandably so. But also because over the last 40 days from the time of his resurrection, they had become used to Jesus disappearing but reappearing. Disappearing but reappearing. So they're looking up, just kind of wondering, I wonder when, the ne- when he's going to appear next. You know, should we wait here a little longer? Should we go back to Jerusalem? And they're just like, oh. And then these two angels appear. And angels have to enjoy their work sometimes, I think, you know. And it, it said, Suddenly they noticed, it's like these angels were, were there, but their whole focus was up there. And I, I just imagine, I'm imagining now, you know, the archangel Gabriel coming up and tapping Peter on the shoulder. He's like, and they're saying, why are you staring up into the sky? That's not where you're going to be looking anymore. You've seen Jesus go up. He's going to come again in the same way. You can trust that, but it's not now. Now your focus needs to change because the presence of God to you is going to be different. It's going to be manifested in a different way. And more importantly, the angels were telling them, don't look up expecting Jesus because now you will expect the Holy Spirit. And in closing this way, by emphasizing the absence of the physical presence of Jesus, Luke emphasizes the coming presence of the Holy Spirit, who will be no less Emmanuel. Because Emmanuel means what? God with us. For a time on earth, Jesus was God with us. In a sense, now the Holy Spirit is Emmanuel. He is God with us, with the church. The presence of the Holy Spirit is the lifeblood of the church. He's our communication. We move in his timing. He's a profoundly great gift. His plans guide the church. His power moves us to effective witnesses of Jesus to the world. And his presence gives us permanent access to God. And that's something that I want to draw out here at the end. The blessing of the presence of the Spirit. He is everywhere and able to be equally present to every child of God. There's no second class citizen. There's no geographical place. There's no difficult access country for the Holy Spirit. He doesn't need a passport to get into a closed country. He doesn't need a visa. He's present to all the children of God. And he can communicate. He can speak the words of God. He can give the church the power to witness. And just this week, I was very comforted by this fact. As I was preparing the sermon, I was one, another one of those early morning wake-ups with a certain level of worry and anxiety about some things that are going on in our lives. About 2.30 in the morning, I awaken and I can't get back to sleep. So I start kind of rehearsing the points of my sermon in in my head, right? And I get to this one and it's like, the presence of the Spirit. God is with me. 
God is here. God is with all his people. And it was such a comfort, the real presence of God by his spirit. We think of it less at times because we, we, we don't see it physically. But that doesn't make it any less real. So the bottom line in this call to transition kind of remains the same for the church, for, for us individuals, as, as it is all through scripture and all through time. The Holy Spirit is God. He's not lesser. He's not a consolation gift. He's the presence of God to his children and his church. So broadly speaking, the question remains the same. Are we submitted and surrendered to God? Are we in submission to the word of God through the spirit? His word. Are we surrendered to his timing? Or are we enforcing our own timeline? Are we convinced that God is a gift to us? The Holy Spirit is a gift. That his plans are supreme, not ours. That he empowers witness and that that's what he wants to do in us. He wants to empower witness. So again, I just want to say right there, if you're confused about what God's will is for you, and that's understandable. I know we have to make decisions. But this is one thing I can tell you is God's will for you, that you would be a witness for Jesus and that he is truly present with and in you. These truths, I believe, should elicit from us two responses. One is a response of surrender, saying, yes, Lord. Yes to your timing, yes to your plans, yes to your witness, yes to your power, yes to your gift, yes to your presence. And the second one is one of gratefulness. Wow, God, look what you have done, look what you have given. And then a desire within us to accept and follow 